CGTN, China Global Television Network. Welcome to The World Today, live from CGTN in London. I'm Jamie Owen. Our top stories. After the storm, President Biden to declare a major disaster in Texas as thousands of people are left without water. Our other headlines, Alexei Navalny, the Russian opposition leader and prominent Putin critic, loses his appeal against his jail sentence. And another night of rioting, the row over a jailed Spanish rapper and freedom of speech reaches the heart of Spain's government. President Biden is set to declare a major disaster for the state of Texas, clearing the way for more government aid after that crippling winter storm. Nearly a quarter of the state's population are struggling with disrupted water supplies, but the state's power grid is back online after five days of blackouts. The temperatures in Texas reached 30-year lows, hitting minus 18 degrees Celsius. Let's talk to our correspondent, Adiz Tianshan, who joins us from Dallas. Adiz, give us the uh, update on the situation on the ground now. How's it looking? What's the situation there? Well, with most people who now have uh, power back on, the main problem appears to be access to uh, running water. Nearly a quarter of the state's population is still impacted. And we could see that through the fact that the state is now airlifting bottled water from outside. And that's because the supply chain has been uh, crippled due to icy roads and uh, dangerous driving conditions. And those water bottles are now being distributed in facilities across the state. We're also seeing food assistance for those, you know, who don't have running water and therefore they cannot cook or they're facing other shortages in their regions. Now, on top of that, just to show how dire the situation has become yesterday in the city of Killeen, there was a fire in a major hotel that was at full capacity, and yet firefighters struggled to find uh, water to suppress the fire. That just shows how dire the situation is. And in order to repair it, it now seems uh, the state will also rely on federal support. And that's why the declaration uh, from the President Joe Biden uh, as, as a federal disaster uh, comes in very handy because now this really appears to be the costliest disaster in recent Texas history, possibly surpassing that of um, the Hurricane Harvey, which cost at about um, $1.9 billion. And now that this has been categorized as a federal disaster, hopefully people can claim more money uh, than what they can through just their insurance companies, and that is if they have an insurance in the first place. Adiz Tianshan in Dallas. Thank you very much indeed. Well, let's talk now to uh, Michael Duckworth, who owns a brewery in Houston, the True Anomaly Brewing Company. He's been helping to uh, get water to uh, those in need. Uh, Michael, um, what has this storm meant for you and your business? What's going on there? Yes, sir, it's, uh, it's been trying for sure. We've, uh, we were down for a few days with no power, electricity, uh, water. Water continues to be an issue, uh, as was indicated in, in the Dallas report there. Uh, we have done our part uh, here in Houston trying to get people good, clean, fresh water. We're open and then uh, operating now. We have what's called a reverse osmosis system that allows us to clean and filter the water. So uh, we've been providing the citizens here in Houston the opportunity to come by the brewery, bring in whatever container you might have, um, and we will fill it up for free and provide you that good potable water. Michael, while you're speaking, I just need to uh, say that uh, President Joe Biden has now formally declared this uh, a major disaster. We were waiting for that announcement just as uh, we came on air, but that confirmation in the last few moments that uh, President Biden has declared this a major disaster, which does now clear the way for uh, the payment of more government aid. Michael, I want to go on to ask you about um, the mood uh, in those communities, because presumably um, residents of Texas uh, must be rather angry about the preparedness of authorities for uh, something like this. Certainly, certainly. I think uh, there's a lot of underlying frustrations on how this came about, why we're still without water today, uh, even though we have power and the roads are clear and uh, we should be getting those supply chains uh, fixed up here in the next week or so. But there's still a lot of concern over what's going on and why 
uh, the power went out to begin with and why they started the rolling blackouts themselves. Um, a lot of confusion on that matter. I would say that people in their current state are primarily fixed on getting their, uh, you know, more primary needs really fulfilled, which is uh, why we're doing the water thing we're doing. Um, but I think there are a lot of questions to be asked, a lot of new information that's been coming out here, um, you know, this week. Uh, utilities are one of those things that we, you know, certainly, um, you know, take advantage of and, and take, uh, you know, for consideration probably. But uh, when it becomes an issue, we certainly wanted to make sure they're available. And right now we're learning maybe there's a lot of things that, uh, you know, prevented that from happening um, in, in manners that we weren't really aware of. So, uh, so I think there's a lot of interest uh, into this story and will continue to be well before we get uh, water and, and electricity back. And uh, we'll have a lot of questions that need to get answered in the following months and to ensure that this doesn't happen again in the years to come as, uh, you know, the climate and whatnot seems to be going in this direction. Michael, we wish you well in the days ahead. And uh, thank you very much indeed for uh, talking to us. Michael Duckworth uh, uh, in Houston. Now the rest of the day's news, and Alexei Navalny, the Russian opposition leader and leading critic of Vladimir Putin, has lost his appeal against his imprisonment. He was detained last month after returning to Russia from Germany, where he was being treated following a nerve agent attack. A short time ago, he was found guilty of a second charge, slandering a Second World War veteran. Our correspondent, Stuart Smith, is in Moscow. Two trials for Alexei Navalny today, one indeed on that libel case against the World War II veteran, but also a major appeal which his lawyers have made against this two-year-long sentence to a prison colony. That, however, has been upheld. So Alexei Navalny will go to a prison colony for two years, six months and two weeks. The only change after the appeal was that the judge agreed it should be lessened slightly by a month and a half after Alexei Navalny spent a month and a half under house arrest. But it continues uh, the claims from both uh, from Alexei Navalny's lawyers that this is a politically motivated case which uh, is trying to get rid of Alexei Navalny from the political scene. The preface of this case is that Alexei Navalny was given a suspended sentence in 2014 after fraud charges, but he broke the rules of that suspended sentence when he went to Germany to receive treatment for Novichok poisoning. His lawyers say, of course, he can't have reported to the police station during that time. The prosecution say that wasn't the only example of him breaking his parole conditions and nor does it matter in this instance so he will be going to that prison colony during the closing statement Navalny as usual made quite an impassioned speech quoting many things but in particular from the Bible saying that uh, blessed are those who hunger for righteousness for they will be satisfied and as things go on there are no protests in Russia at the moment protests have been postponed by Alexei Navalny's organization until spring and summer but they are trying to use uh, political pressure from outside Russia looking to the EU, looking to the United States, and a group of EU foreign ministers will be meeting with Navalny's top team in Berlin on Sunday. Stuart Smith, CGTN, Moscow. The UK government's plans to ease the lockdown are beginning to emerge. Care home residents will be allowed one visitor each from the 8th of March. That's according to the health minister. The government says reuniting families and opening schools are the priorities. Prime Minister Boris Johnson will reveal the full details on Monday. Let's talk to our correspondent Guy Henderson, who's following the story in London. Guy, so signs of a roadmap out of this, a cautious uh, lifting of UK lockdown. Yeah, it's been a long lockdown. And there has also been a rapid vaccine rollout. So that means that across the UK as a whole, there are some regional variations on this, but across the UK as a whole, infection rates have been falling quite fast, which is why on Monday, Boris Johnson, the UK Prime Minister, is going to be outlining this roadmap for easing restrictions in England, uh, at least. But there is a debate that appears to still be going on right through the weekend about what exactly the very first step in that easing process should be. The government have said... Um, very clearly that they want uh, schools to be the priority uh, and that they hope um, that if the data allows it that um, that should be able to begin happening, the reopening of schools, from uh, the 8th of March. But there is uh, one camp in, within that debate on, on schools uh, who want uh, all schools and all age groups to go back at the same time uh, and another camp that says we should take a more cautious and phased approach 
uh, in that camp, we understand, is not just quite a few um, teaching unions and teaching leaders, but also the chief medical officer of the UK government, Chris Whitty, possibly because some of the data suggests uh, that, that, that the infection rate is highest at the moment amongst um, school-age children. The problem, uh, certainly according to lockdown critics with that phased approach, is that it may then risk pushing back the date by which other sections of society uh, and the economy can reopen. There's discussion in the weekend press uh, about the possibility of households being able to mix outside by Easter time, early April, possibly even pubs uh, being allowed to serve takeaway drinks. Um, but all of the dates for those kinds of measures could be heavily influenced by um, a, an agreement uh, on that very first step, which is the, on, uh, which is the opening of schools. And that is a, a discussion which is going on right up to the wire. Meanwhile, the next political crisis after the pandemic is not too far away for Boris Johnson, it seems. Uh, there looks to be some uh, turmoil at the heart of Downing Street. Yeah, so um, there's a couple of points to make here. The first is British politics has pretty much been upended um, during the course of this pandemic. And one of the ways that it has been upended is that the devolved government in Scotland has won a lot of praise for its handling of this crisis. So it is riding high in the polls ahead of parliamentary elections uh, in Scotland, which are due to take place in early May. And that devolved Scottish government wants a referendum on independence, which would mean the breakup of the United Kingdom. Now, the British government uh, here in, uh, in London has had put a man in charge of countering that, the momentum of that independence movement, um, a, a man called Oliver Lewis. But on Friday, he was fired from his job. And that means that during this crucial period, there is nobody in charge uh, of the British government effort to counter the independence movement. Um, this could also, Lewis's firing could also have a bearing on the future relationship between the UK and the EU as well, because Lewis was one of the last high-level uh, members of the inner circle of Boris Johnson that's been influential all the way back to that referendum in 2016 from that so-called hard Brexit camp. He is now gone. Uh, Lord Frost, the former Brexit chief negotiator, by the same token, has now been uh, moved up into a cabinet level position in charge of managing uh, the future relationship between the UK and the EU. He is seen as having views in line with that sort of hard Brexit camp, if you like. Basically, what I'm saying is there is a pretty vicious turf war going on inside the very highest levels of the British government at the moment, and its outcome could have pretty profound implications on the future of the UK uh, and its relationship with the EU going forward. Guy Henderson in London, thank you very much. Protests are expected to continue in Spain after the imprisonment of a rapper sparked a row over free speech and the power of the police. That row has now reached the heart of government, as Rahul Pathak reports from Madrid. Now, the violent protests uh, that took place right here in Madrid and around the country were sparked by the jailing of Spanish rapper Pablo Hassel for nine months for glorifying terrorism and insulting the royal family. Now, his case has prompted fresh questions over freedom of speech here in Spain. But after Tuesday's riots, it's also sparked a debate on how the police deal with civil disturbances after they were accused of being heavy-handed in their response. Me parece totalmente injusta. I think it's unfair. He's just a guy, a rapper with his own opinion, and you can agree with him or not, but you have to respect it. About the protest affecting the businesses, I think it was irresponsible given the situation they're going through. I wasn't here when it all happened, but my colleagues were. They told me they were nervous because of what was happening. People were taking pieces of rock and throwing it at them. You're here just working and it's not normal that that kind of stuff happens to you. Now, as I mentioned, there were similar scenes all over Spain, especially in Catalonia, which is Pablo Hassel's home state. The rioting has continued there every night since Tuesday, in fact. Now, the impact of Hassel's arrest and the ensuing violence could have far-reaching consequences for Spain's ruling socialist coalition, and Prime Minister Pedro Sanchez. One of their junior partners in the coalition has demanded that the rapper be pardoned whilst criticising the police for their alleged brutality. Well, Sanchez has come out in support of the police and condemned the violence. Now, a split in the ruling coalition could spark fresh national elections here in Spain, which, when you're trying to fight a global pandemic, is probably the last thing anyone needs. 
Rahul Pathak, CGTN, Madrid. You're watching CGTN still ahead. How technology could help get children back into classrooms after COVID. Don't forget you can sign up to our daily newsletter. We bring you all the top business headlines straight to your inbox. So sign up for free at this address. CGTN. See the difference. Patient after patient after patient. They take a long time to get better. They're the sickest patients we've ever seen. It's a race against time because we can all see uh, the threat that uh, our NHS faces, the pressure it's under. We're dealing with something we knew very little about. Europe's first two epicenters in February have received their first dose of the Pfizer BioNTech vaccine. Another day, another grim milestone for the UK in its fight against COVID-19. 100,000 people have now lost their lives after contracting the virus. Reminder of our top stories. After the storm, President Biden declares a major disaster in Texas as thousands of people are left without water. And Alexei Navalny, the Russian opposition leader and prominent Putin critic, loses his appeal against his jail sentence. The director of the International Atomic Energy Agency is in the Iranian capital, Tehran. Rafael Grossi is there for talks on Iran's nuclear program. Tehran is planning to limit inspections of its nuclear sites from Tuesday. On Friday, the United States acknowledged for the first time it's willing to have direct talks on a return to the 2015 Iran nuclear deal. Syed Hussein Musavin is the Middle East security and nuclear policy specialist at Princeton University and a former Iranian ambassador to Germany. I asked him whether he was surprised that the new U.S. president hadn't made the Iranian nuclear talks a priority. I believe uh, the problem is within the Biden administration. My understanding is that the pre President Biden was serious to go fast and uh, straight. But uh, when he nominated his team, now there is a dispute within his team. A part, uh, a camp uh, it says, we should go back to uh, JCPOA, the nuclear deal, correctly, precisely, and quickly, and we should not uh, put any other condition. There is another camp saying that we need to use the uh, leverage uh, Trump sanctions and we need to uh, negotiate with Iran uh, on regional issues also. Therefore, we should be sure if we return to JCPOA, Iran would be ready to negotiate to discuss the regional issues. Practically, they are putting a condition and precondition, and this is, they know Iran would never accept. That's why they are going to talk with the allies in order to create an international uh, a united front against Iran to have uh, JCPOA plus uh, regional. That's why uh, I believe they are delaying. Realistically, do you think in the longer term uh, the United States can rejoin the deal or did the Trump administration's actions erode uh, any credibility or, or trust? 
Actually, uh, it is really important to understand that despite of 35 years of hostilities, animosities between Tehran and Washington, uh, the Iran nuclear deal was the first uh, issue, very important issue, uh, that uh, Iran and the U.S. Uh, had direct high-level negotiations and they could manage through negotiation and diplomacy and it was not only bilateral, it was unilateral, it was international, other five other uh, big powers, China, Russia, Europe, they were there. And the United Nations Security Council passed the resolution and for three years, Iran fully complied with zero failure and it was the US who failed. Therefore, this has left a very, very bad experience to Iran that you really cannot trust the U.S. How successful have America's sanctions on Iran been and at what cost for Iran's political leadership? Actually, uh, I would say uh, the uh, maximum pressure policy of Trump uh, and the unprecedented sanctions have imposed hundreds of billions of dollars of cost uh, to Iran. Definitely it had a huge cost uh, for Iran, no doubt about it. Two people have been killed in Myanmar during protests over the army's takeover. Local media is reporting they were killed by police who fired live rounds. Hundreds of demonstrators have gathered for a strike at a shipyard. There have been weeks of protests after the army seized power from the elected government led by Aung San Suu Kyi. Nearly 1,400 people have been forced to leave their homes after flooding hit the Indonesian capital Jakarta and there could be much worse to come. The country's meteorological agency has warned the heaviest rain of the monsoon season may fall in and around the city in the coming days. Thousands of people have joined anti-vaccination protests across Australia ahead of a COVID-19 inoculation program next week. Police in Melbourne used pepper spray and made several arrests. Australia's plan is to vaccinate the entire population by October. The country has recorded just under 29,000 cases and 909 deaths. Belarus has received 100,000 doses of COVID vaccines from China. The country's health minister welcomed the Sinopharm jabs at Minsk airport. China's ambassador to the country said he hoped the vaccines would play a role in Belarus's fight against the pandemic. New Zealand has begun COVID vaccinations with border workers, the first to receive the jab. It's the next phase in the battle against the virus that the country has largely contained. Our correspondent Owen Poland reports. It's the shot in the arm that New Zealand has been waiting for and the first step in the long road to recovery from the pandemic. Today represents a small but important step in a long journey. It's the start of what we might call a new chapter, but we still have a long way to go in the evolving COVID-19 story. The first people to receive the jab are border workers, like these hotel staff who are on the front line of New Zealand's fight against COVID-19. We were in it together and we all got done at the same time, so I think we're just very fortunate to have that, to have that done. New Zealand's vaccine rollout has started here at Auckland's Jet Park Hotel, and that's because this is the quarantine centre where anyone who tests positive to COVID-19 is taken until they recover. And that also means that anyone who works here faces a huge risk of infection. New Zealand has so far received only 60,000 doses of the Pfizer vaccine, which is enough to protect around 12,000 border workers. But over the next few months, another 1.5 million doses will arrive to start inoculating older people and then the general population later this year. We should all be proud that in less than a year since our first confirmed case of COVID-19, we are ready to go with what will be the biggest single logistical exercise our health system has ever tackled. Plans are being prepared for mass vaccinations in sports stadiums, but surveys indicate that only 70% of the population are willing to get the vaccine. So the government will have to mount an education campaign to overcome mistrust 
especially in ethnic communities who face the greatest risk of infection and death. New Zealand is very privileged to have this vaccine. It's, it's the best in the world. And the message from the first people to be vaccinated is simple. Get it. I got it. I wouldn't have gotten it if I didn't think that it was safe. But while the arrival of the vaccine is welcomed, there are still many unanswered questions about its effectiveness. Does it stop infected people from passing on the virus? How long does the protection last? And will people need to get fresh vaccinations every year like they do to protect against the flu? Owen Poland, CGTN, Auckland. With schools in many countries still shut because of the pandemic, many students, parents, children and teachers are missing classroom learning. A China-based company has developed a robot which aims to get children back to school safely. Francis Quo reports. That familiar ringing of the school bell, signaling a relative return to normal, but not everywhere. We may never get to, to back to normal, but we need to come up with some sort of a new normal where our students are going to have um, what they need so that they can be successful. Disinfection start. What they need could be in the form of this robot. It uses ultraviolet light to disinfect classrooms and objects. It basically scrambles the DNA and RNA of pathogens and, you know, and disallowing it from replicating. Four of the robots were deployed during a pilot program at a school district in the U.S. state of Delaware. China-based robotics company UB Tech is behind the invention, which they say is 99.9% .9 effective. One version is controlled manually. Another has sensors allowing it to move on its own. We need to make sure that our teachers and our staff feel comfortable in the buildings if we're going to bring students back. During the two-week pilot, the robots were used in areas where two students who tested positive had been. The CDC recommends 24 to 48 hours before a room where there was a positive case can be used again. This technology allows that, that room to be safe almost immediately. Robot is working. Please keep away. The UV light used by the robots can be harmful to humans, so the robots come with additional safety measures. You have an array of sensors on top as well as a RGB camera that's using AI to basically scan the room, looking for somebody to, that enters into the room. If, it, if somehow somebody evades detection of the safety sign, then the robot is constantly monitoring whether or not somebody is in that space and it will shut down. The robot's price tag is relatively steep, 20,000 US dollars for the manual version, 40,000 for the autonomous one. The Delaware district hasn't decided whether it will buy the robots, but they do welcome a helping hand and bringing some normalcy back to the classroom. And to try to make sure that uh, we're giving that extra layer of protection. If you don't feel safe in your building, you're not going to be able to uh, concentrate on what we need you to concentrate on, which is teaching and learning. Francis Coe, CGTN. The headlines again. While we've been on air, President Biden has declared formally a major disaster for Texas, clearing the way now for more government aid after a crippling winter storm. And that's it for The World Today. Thank you for watching. We're available on smart TV apps such as Roku, Apple TV, Amazon Fire and Android TV. You can also find us on YouTube and Daily Motion, as well as CGTN.com and on the CGTN app. Coming up next on CGTN, it's Entrepreneurs on the Agenda with Stephen Cole. But from me, goodbye.